The harness closes with a reassuring click, holding your body tight against the seat. The heavy steel door to your left has been closed from the outside, and all around you there are panels, lights, and switches. A complex and nearly baffling array of gauges, instruments, as well as levers. But this is what you trained for, and this is what you know, and as far as you can tell, everything looks good. Through your headset, you can hear the last checks being completed, and it feels like no time at all before a voice begins to count down from 10 in Russian. You are about to make history. You can feel it. All the work, all the effort, all the sacrifice, it has built up to this moment in this moment alone. Imagine being the first man to ever make it into space. But your name is not Yuri Gagarin, and the year is not 1961. As the countdown finishes, a deafening roar is all around you. The relative calm is shattered as unimaginable forces erupt from the thrusters and begin to propel you skyward. You are forced back into your seat, barely able to do anything other than just do your best to stay conscious as you feel your craft gaining speed, slowly at first, but ever increasing. The safety of the land underneath you disappears rapidly as you accelerate ever upwards, splitting the clouds and hurtling upwards towards the very limits of this planet that we call home. All systems are normal, everything works as it should, and despite all doubts, despite the worry, potentially even despite the objections of many of the team, it seems for one glorious second that you are about to cement your name forever in the annals of human history. But just as soon as the thought crosses your mind, it all seems to go wrong. Alarms begin to sound and lights begin to flash. The voice in your ears is trying and failing to keep the mild panic out of their voice. You make the adjustments and run the checklist like you've been trained to do. Nothing seems to be helping. Space is supposed to be cold, so why is everything feeling so warm all of a sudden? Why do you smell acrid smoke? Just before the electronics fry and your last connection to Earth is cut forever, you realize the truth. The doubters were right. They could get you out here, but there was no chance you were ever getting back in one piece. Until the very end, you battle in vain to save yourself as the heat increases and plumes of smoke begin to enter the cabin. You can't be sure if they can still hear you back at the launch site, but if they can, you're telling them exactly what you think about them. They should have tested more. They should have planned better. They shouldn't have gone ahead if they weren't sure. Somewhere out there in a secret Soviet launch center, a man takes off his headset so he doesn't have to listen to your fiery demise. Yet another failure, and another one the rest of the world is never going to hear about. While that might sound like a bit of fanciful bit of fiction, it is the basis for the theory that we are looking at today, the Lost Cosmonauts. The idea that the first man in space was actually not the first, he was just the first to make it back alive. And while it all sounds ridiculous at first glance, is there a chance that there is some truth to this rumor? What is it that people who believe this theory actually think? What evidence is there, if any, to support this? To properly discuss the Lost Cosmonauts, we need to go to the Soviet Union and first look at what we know for sure before we even start to think about what we might not. Yuri Gagarin was the first man who officially made it into space on April 12, 1961. He was a part of the Vostok program or project, and due to the limitations of planned craft, candidates really had to be small in stature. Yuri fit the bill at only 5 foot 2 inches. Short kings rise up. Before his training, he was already an accomplished pilot, and during his selection, he pushed himself hard, impressing both his compatriots and superiors. In the end, it was he who was chosen as the first man for this historic mission, or alleged first man. After making his successful trip to outer space in Vostok 1, he landed safely to a hero's welcome. He had put the Soviet Union on the map in their space race and scored a mighty blow. But what's hilarious is, uh, as Americans, we made it to the moon first, so we automatically win. After spending time being paraded in front of crowds and cameras alike for the world to see, Yuri would eventually lose his life seven years later when a jet he piloted crashed, killing him instantly. But he was immortalized forever with his achievement and made his mark on human history. But the mission was not without risk and danger. While every precaution was taken and extensive testing carried out, it's fair to say that no one would ever just immediately go straight into sending human beings into space. It started a lot smaller than that, specifically with flies that were sent up to space in 1947 and that were recovered safe and alive. Scientists then moved on to sending monkeys in outer space, and there's an entire song about this in subsequent flights, hooked up to sensors that would monitor their well-being during the mission. Sadly, many more of them died during this process than made it back alive because, to be honest with you, it's bad, but if you're sending monkeys in outer space, it, the recovery process is probably not as important. Well, it, it would be important to a lot of people, but to the Soviet Union, probably not very important. 
Dogs then begin to be sent up on these missions, equipped with instruments that could monitor their vital signs and see how they responded to the stresses and strains of a launch, as well as the weightlessness and re-entry. The very first one that is of note was a dog named Laika. Her breed was a mix, and she had been found on the streets and ended up being sent up on Sputnik 2. She never made it back to Earth, unfortunately, but this was really never part of the plan to begin with. While she became the first animal in orbit, or at least orbited Earth successfully, the technology was just simply not available at the time to get the capsule to re-enter once it had launched into orbit in 1957. While the initial story was that Laika died naturally from depletion of oxygen after multiple days, it would eventually come out that due to a mechanical failure, she died of overheating and possibly stress after orbiting the Earth a number of times. Her vitals were monitored the whole time, and the entire process served as a way for scientists to check the viability of human flight. The fact that Laika managed to survive the stresses and strains of takeoff and weightlessness made them a lot more confident in the viability of human manned missions. There was, and remains, mixed thoughts on the ethics behind such an experiment, and some believe, and understandably so, that there is something unimaginably cruel about sending a dog into space with no possibility of survival or retrieval, but you have to remember, it's the Soviet Union. Well, you know, to be honest with you, it's probably, uh, let's be real here, most governments in general, uh, who have any access to anything that they want to try or test out, there's got to be something that loses is the best way to put this. So, others see the merit that is provided in terms of data and the potential lives that were saved by this undertaking. However, using animals in this way will always be a source of debate with many people. So against the backdrop of what we have been told and what is generally accepted to be these notable firsts in the pursuit of spaceflight, why do people believe that there were previous unsuccessful attempts that have been covered up? One of the pillars of this theory is based on the relative secrecy that the USSR maintained around its space program. During the era in question, there was very much a sense of keeping information to themselves and certainly not broadcasting their actions or movements to the West. The achievements and successes that they had? Oh yeah, you better believe that those were paraded front and center. They were shouted from the rooftops and rubbed in the face of the USA and other powers. After all, they weren't nothing but more proof that the USSR was doing it right and the West had it wrong. Again, one of my uh, favorite stories about the pissing contest between the USSR and USS <laughs> USA is there was a town, I think it was in West Virginia, that needed a bridge built across one river so it saved them an hour and a half of traveling through back roads to get to like the town across the river. And the USA was like, sorry, we can't do it. So they contacted the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union's like, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll fund a bridge there. So they put it in all of their papers in the Soviet Union that basically the US couldn't even provide a bridge for their people. People. The U.S. saw this and was like, oops, so then they had to build the bridge. It's like, it almost would have been funny had there not been nukes at play. But anyways, the space race was a source of fierce competition that took on a mantle greater than the issue itself. It became the very proof of who was correct, who was right, and who had put their faith in the best system in the correct way to not only run a country, but a society in general. And for a long time, it was hard to argue that the USSR weren't winning. They managed to tick off a number of firsts. They seemed to be pushing the envelope with every passing expedition and effort. There was always something new to achieve. Some other boundary duty pushed, and it appeared to the outside world as though they were doing a very good job of it. But along with a culture and a history of secrecy comes the space where conspiracy theories can very clearly exist. In the vacuum of information, especially with a regime that was so tight-lipped, there is always room for people to fill in the gaps with what they believe because that's what the human brain does. Basically, if we don't know what's going on, we start making stuff up because not only do we make up, like, has that helped us all throughout human history? But when we make things up, we also make up things that are even worse than what the actual reality is because it would always save our species in the past or at least helped. So when we consider the second proposed theory, while there is something very cold and callous about it, there really isn't anything about it at first glance that is beyond the realm of possibility. The path to many firsts in human history have been littered with the bodies of those who tried before. Those brave, intrepid individuals who flew a little too close to the sun in the endless pursuit of creating history, and they ended up paying for it dearly. In fact, this is how we know what mushrooms we can eat and what mushrooms we can't eat. But those who believe the theory point to these sorts of cover-ups that the Soviet Union had carried out, for example, the death of Valentin Bondarenko, probably did not say that correctly, but you know, that's kind of because I'm not Russian. He was a fighter pilot who was chosen to train as a cosmonaut in his early 20s. Disaster would strike, however, during an extended stay in an altitude chamber. When a fire started in the chamber, the high oxygen level meant that it burnt out of control pretty much immediately. And due to the differences in pressure between the outside where it was located, it took 30 minutes to equalize the pressure and allow medical staff access, which at that point, he had been burnt all over his body. He would end up losing his life after being taken to the hospital, but news of his death was not widely circulated. 
It would be nearly 20 years later when the news of the incident would actually be released. And aside from the general idea that the USSR at the time would have kept a lid on these sort of failures, is there any real tangible evidence put forward that backs the claim of these lost cosmonauts? Well, according to some, there is. There is a number of audio recordings that exist alleged to have been picked up by random amateur radio operators that depict the exact scenario we fictitiously outlined in the introduction. Torre Bert was a location where a pair of Italian brothers were situated when they allegedly picked up recordings from these space missions and even the lost cosmonauts themselves. They were named Achille and Giovanni and had claimed to have tracked and listened in the transmissions from a number of undocumented space flights by the Soviets or at least attempts at them. As early as 1960, they reportedly heard transmissions from a capsule that managed to make it into orbit but then lost its directional control and was lost to space. The next year, they reported hearing three potential deaths of cosmonauts, one suffocating, one going off course into space again, and a third one that was requesting assistance. Some of these apparent messages are available on the internet to this day. Here's a translated transcript of one that says, Conditions growing worse, why don't you answer? We are going slower, the world will never know about us. Other radio operators located in space as far afield as the UK and the US, as well as elsewhere in Europe, have claimed over the years to have heard many different messages, but with apparent similar themes. Some of the alleged content of these were SOS multiple times, a voice saying that they were going to die in Russian, and even some names such as Korolov, a surname to one of the most important minds behind the missions. There have been reports of hearing Mayday or its equivalent, and a whole slew of other messages that would seem to imply there were indeed people up there and it was going terribly wrong for them. But how likely does it seem to be that every single one of these people would individually hear the same sort of message and interpret it in the same way? Interestingly, as well as claiming to have listened in to these tragedies that were covered up, the Italian brothers also claimed that there were unsung successes. Not long before Yuri made his first flight, they said that they tracked and recorded a mission that successfully orbited the Earth and then landed safely. Why the Soviets would have not claimed this success, though, is not known. A similar theory is that Vladimir Ilyshin, and again, <laughs> I, I'm doing my best, I'm from the south in the US, was planned to be the first in space, and some allege that he was actually the first man in general, but there were issues with his flights that resulted in him crash landing in China and being badly hurt. Instead of admitting failure, those in charge of the program just covered it up, instead claiming that he had been injured in a car crash and went ahead with Yuri as the first official flight. So what do those that don't believe in the lost cosmos have to say about it? After all, it does feel a lot harder to try to prove that something never happened. To understand one of the most common arguments put across, we need to do a little more to understand the nature of the competition between the USSR and USA at the time. And specifically to one of the most common arguments used by those who believe that the 1969 moon landings definitely happened. The two nations who were doing everything in their power not only to succeed and to win whatever the next achievement and goal was, but they were also spending enormous amounts of time and effort trying to monitor what the other was doing and keeping eye on the progress of their competitor. They each used every available method of observation and assessment that they had open to them, tracking launches and trying to keep tabs on the development process. In fact, I've actually done a video over the CIA documents where people were using, I think it was astral projection. And interestingly, some of them actually had good information so uh yeah you should go check that video out but by the time that they were both regularly conducting successful man and repeated missions you better believe that each country was well aware of what the other was doing not only that but they were actively tracking the progress and position of these launches and flights one of the most famous examples is the north american aerospace defense command or norad it was established in 1958 initially as an early warning system and to generally monitor any activity within the aerospace the argument when it comes to the moon landing deniers and honestly that could be a whole other video is that if there was even the slightest hint or the most tiny chance that the USA had faked some sort or maybe even all of its Apollo moon landing mission you had better believe that the USSR would have been straight there to tell the world but after all if your opponent has beaten you by cheating or by faking then all you need to do is provide proof show the evidence and then let them be the subject of ridicule for the rest of the world to see it's an easy home run to be honest with you they are humiliated in a public sphere and trust is not only just completely gone in their space program, but in them as a nation, it's going to drop hugely. 
Similarly, when it comes to the Lost Cosmonauts, while the technology wouldn't really have been quite as advanced as it was just like early 1960s as opposed to the late 1960s, there is no chance that the USA weren't monitoring and tracking every single flight that the USSR had put up. They would be keeping a close eye on it all, and if there was a disaster or failure, especially one that resulted in the loss of one or several human lives, while it may be unsavory for us to think about, it could have well been used by the USA to kind of point at the Russians and be like, hey, you don't know what you're doing. All they would have to do to circumnavigate the seemingly constant stream of success stories and victories coming out of the USSR was to release a report or an observation or an audio recording of these manned missions going tragically wrong, and it would have turned public opinion. Would it have been a pretty terrible thing to do? Arguably, yes, but no worse than killing your own cosmonauts and covering up their deaths in the name of winning. Since no evidence from the American side has ever emerged, either at the time or in the intervening decades, many skeptics look at this as proof that this is all just a theory. And it needs to be noted that the Soviet Union didn't always try to sweep its failures and tragedies under the rug. Take the case of Vladimir Kamarov, another well-respected and experienced cosmonaut. He manned the Soyuz 1 mission, which encountered endless problems. And I know I just said Soyuz 1 mission. Weird. It is what it is. Pretty much everything went wrong on his journey. On re-entry, his parachute failed to deploy and the capsule impacted the ground at full speed. What was left of him was photographed and the image has been released. If they were willing to admit to and publish such a failure, would it seem likely that they would cover up others? Also, probably wouldn't recommend looking that one up, although some of you are going to go look that up, but good lord. So according to those who heard and listened in on the recordings of the communication, even before his shoot failed and he knew he would die, he was described as crying with frustration about the mission. Even after the veil of secrecy fell after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, no hard evidence ever appeared. Information began to be accessible for the first time, and still, nothing conclusive was ever found. It appears as though these recordings and alleged audio interceptions are the strongest case for the theory of lost cosmonauts, and those who were and remain cool have pointed out a few issues with these recordings that were produced. As well as failures to follow correct radio protocol and not using correct terms during their transmissions, some have pointed out that the accents heard are not typically Russian and there are issues with how they speak, errors that a native speaker may not make. One of the things brought up is, did the girlfriend of the Italians record the audio? Both brothers fully insisted that the recordings were genuine and some of the other messages that were intercepted by operators other than the brothers have been analyzed where possible and deemed anything from misinterpretation to hoaxes. Many of them simply never kept copies and as such we have nothing to go on other than the testimony of the radio operator at that time. Basically, there isn't a single piece of audio that appears to experts to have stood up to scrutiny. Not that it would stop the most ardent believers from still accepting them as genuine. And that is basically where we have to leave the theory of the lost cosmonauts, as in every case is up to the individual to make up their mind whether they believe that this is plausible as a concept or not. There are plenty of arguments that have been made on both sides, but the question that many ask when they look at this theory is whether or not the Soviet Union, at this time and in the atmosphere, would cover up something as big or impactful as a death within their space program. And the answer to that has to be yes. As we have discussed earlier, the tragic death of anyone during training, uh, they could and did suppress information that would make them look bad, things that would alter public perception of the program. The audio recordings that were made, no matter what you think of them, don't really seem to match up with the information that is now available to the world about the program, and the reality is, is that the amount of documentation that was released after the fall of the USSR is truly breathtaking. It isn't just official records, logs, and hard data. There are also personal notebooks, logs, that engineers and scientists kept that contained facts not directly related to the work they were carrying out. So we need to ask ourselves, how likely is it that they would have managed to completely expunge any reference to an incident as big as multiple lost cosmonauts or their deaths on these missions? Even with widespread destruction of documentation, how possible is it that such a thing could have been unilaterally erased from all existence? highly improbable and would have to be the conclusion that most would reach. When we add in the fact that there was no detection of these alleged flights on NORAD, it's hard to see that these lost cosmonauts could have actually existed. The West would have undoubtedly noticed and reported any rogue flights that were planned, even more so when they realized the results were likely to have been deadly or embarrassing. And with all this information and documentation that is now available to researchers out there, they know the details of the flight program intimately. They can plot out exactly who is in each training program who is at each location, their names, ages, and backgrounds as well. None of it matches the flights where these doomed cosmonauts flew off into the vast nothingness of space or burned up on re-entry. But it is always up to the individual, once again, to decide for themselves. Maybe these audio recordings are nothing more than a radio enthusiast's girlfriend speaking broken Russian with a heavy Italian accent, and those who want to believe this occurred just ignore the heavy hints. Or maybe 
Just maybe, there were some of these brave men and women who took the ultimate risk and then paid the ultimate price. Perhaps they dedicated their lives to try and achieve the world's first, knowing the harm, knowing the probable outcome, and ended up losing their lives. Wherever you fall on the idea of lost cosmonauts, if it does ever end up being confirmed as true, then there are few thoughts more sobering than the idea of hurtling off into space with no one or nothing to help you, and knowing for a fact that no one will have ever known that you ever existed. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed or you have a topic you'd like me to cover, leave it down in the comments. Leaving a like is also great, and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. I'll drop my Patreon and Twitter and whatnot, pretty much everything that I always do in the description as well as merch. And speaking of Patreon, I'd like to thank mine real quick. At the literal Wendigo tier, we have Grayson West, Ron Burgundy, Stupid Fox, and Trash Panda in a trench coat. Thank you very much for your support, guys. At the Eyewitness to the Event tier, we have Beaver Malaga and Wet Skeleton. At the first hand accounts, we have Cody Cherry Drake, Yeeps, and at second hand accounts, we have Bianca, Hayden Johnson, Fred Rush, and Troy. And to the rest of my patrons, I do appreciate y'all's help or support as well. Help? Really? Actually, no, it is help, so I appreciate y'all. Uh, anyhow, that's gonna do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed. I'll see y'all in the next one.